All right, this video is going to be going over second order differential equations and starting to introduce um, some topics that we'll be talking about in our text, chapter four. Um, so some reminders here about what an initial value problem is, and then also that you must have continuity of all of, let me scroll back up just a smidge. You must have continuity of all of these functions of x on that same interval in order to have a unique solution. So in order to actually find um, with your initial conditions a unique um, one-of-a-kind solution that's like that has to be it, just remember that all of those f of x functions have to be continuous on the same interval and your leading one can never be zero as well. The reason being, if you ended up having a zero here, you would no longer have an nth order, you would have an n minus one order. So to keep it to that nth order for the derivative, and that leading function cannot be zero. So if I needed to look at this first example and it's like, hey, um, I have some initial values centered about x equals zero, um, what interval could I have a unique solution on? Well, I don't have to worry about anything in front of my y double prime because I have a one, but that tangent is gonna cause some issues. So I'm only going to be good from negative pi over two to pi over two. All right, another example to look at is making sure we understand how to verify that this equation right here is indeed a solution to this second order differential equation and then actually going in and finding C1 and C2. So one thing that we can do is we can break this up into three different functions and as long as each piece, um, when you take derivatives and plug things in here, um, follows it, then, then we'll be good to go. So what I mean by that is like, maybe we call a y1 e to the 2x, and I know that I need to go all the way up to the second derivative. So let's go y1 prime and y1 double prime. And let's see what happens when I plug in here. Well, I get 4 e to the 2x minus 4 times e to the 2x Okay, that gives me zero. So if I plug in this first term, really no matter what this C1 term is, I'm gonna end up getting zero. Well, um, Y2, let's see what happens when I plug this in, and you probably will see that you end up getting something extremely familiar to what we did here. And that also gives me zero. And even if I had this like C1, C2 here in the front, okay, that's, they're gonna end up canceling out. Like it doesn't matter what that constant is for any constant, if you wanted to add those in there, you could. All right, well, let's see what's going on because this, when I plug this in, right, I get zero. And when I'm plugging this in and taking derivatives, I'm getting zero. So let's see what happens when I plug in, maybe we call this y3, negative 3x. Okay, well that would be y3 prime would be negative 3, and y3 double prime would be zero. So zero minus 4 times negative 3x. Oh, that's where the 12x comes from here. Okay, so this first one, when I plug it in, I get zero, great. This one, when I plug it in, I get zero, great. And then here, when I plug in Y3, I get that 12X piece over here. So that is where that 12X piece comes from on the right-hand side when I plug in the derivative. All right, the second piece of this, um, and I'm gonna just have to scroll down and use a little bit of some blank space here, but if I have that Y of zero is four, and I believe this is y prime of zero is one. Let's go ahead and find these pieces. So I, if I know that four is equal to c1e to the zero 
plus c2 e to the 0 minus 0. Then I know that 4 is equal to c1 plus c2. And then y prime being equal to negative 1, okay, so that would be 1 is equal to 2 c1 e to the 0 minus 2 c2 e to the 0 minus 3. Add that over, I'm going to have 4 is equal to 2c1 minus 2c2. I can then solve this like a system of equations. Um, I'm going to do like a stack method. I'm going to multiply this top function by 2. These would cancel and I would get 4C1 equals 12. So C1 has to be 3. And then I'm going to go back up here. Well, if C1 is 3, then C2 must be 1. And so then I could say back up here at the top, if C3 or C1 is 3 and C2 is 1, that my um, solution through these two points my unique solution, because I'm continuous everywhere, I don't need to really worry about that, would be 3 e to the 2x plus e to the negative 2x minus 3x would be like my final solution to this differential equation through those points. All right, one thing we really need to be careful of is when we have boundary values versus in... Um, initial values. So on our boundary values, you might have two pieces of x and a y1, y2. Um, and when we have those, it might not be a unique function. Okay, so if you have those boundary conditions, it might be true that you still have the curve. And based on your your pieces here, you might actually have two different or multiple different options. So I'm going to choose to do this one um, a little bit quicker just by keeping everything in the function. So I'm going to verify this by saying negative 4c1 sine 4t plus 4c2 cosine 4t and then x double prime would be negative, negative 16 C1 cosine 4T and negative 16 C2 sine 4T. And then hopefully you see when we plug this in for X double prime plus 16 times X, yes, we definitely get zero when we do that. All right, let's try to find C1 and C2 if I know these two boundary points here. So if that's the case, then I know 0 equals C1 cosine of 0 plus C2 sine of 0. Sine of 0 is 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. So I know C1 must be 0. So then I can plug in my second point. I know C1 is 0, so I'm not going to include this first term. So just C2 sine of 4 pi over 2. Well, this is 0, so it doesn't matter what C2 is. Any number times 0 is always 0, so I can't solve this for C2. Or I would know x of t is some constant times sine of 4t, and it doesn't matter what that constant is because of the 4t, um, so I have 4, because of that, I have 4 revolutions from 0 to pi, so because of that, like, this is always going to have these two zeros, so I'm kind of, I'm kind of stuck there, or I would say there's infinitely many solutions. All right, let's look at another situation. 
Um, in this case, I have the exact same value here, so I'm good there. Now let's see what happens when I plug this in. So zero equals C2 sine of, let's see, that's going to be 4 pi over 8. So in this case, 4 pi over 8, this is 1, because that would be pi over 2, which means C2 has to be 0. Well, now I have a completely arbitrary solution because I have that my solution is this, and that doesn't really tell me anything. Like, that's just a horizontal line in our plane. So, like, there's one solution, but it's not, it's not a good solution. Like, it doesn't really tell me anything. All right, and then let's look at this last one. Again, I have this piece here, so I know C1 equals 0. And let's see if this is 1 equals C2 sine of um, 4 pi over 2, where this is 0. Well, in this case, there is no number C2 times zero that would get me one. So in this case, there would be no solution. So that's kind of three unique um, cases that you might look at when you don't have a particular solution um, with an intermediate value question. Like you might just have two pieces, especially on these sine and cosine graphs where you have that cyclic um, isolation oscillating function um, that you have to know very distinct values on that function in order to just have pieces of your solution curve. Now, if you know derivatives, then usually you can you can know a little bit more. But if you just have two points on your curve, you might not always be able to find that particular solution.